for today. We'll talk about Kashrut. Um, these are the readings. Um, by the way, if you haven't already, I have tried to link it at times, but Celebrate Messiah has a Messianic calendar. Um, it's, you can just go through to the direct web page and then you go down to resources and the Messianic calendar and it has all these readings. So I'm, I'm using there, I'm just cutting and pasting from the website. So if you guys want to keep, keep track of all the readings, just use that. It's very easy to do. Yeah, so let's talk about it. So I have talked about Kashrut before. Um, I, you, I have talked in the past more about the technical side of things, um, but today I'm not going to do that so much. Um, just very, very briefly, I will just talk about a few things and also give a disclaimer, because I think that's important. So, so first of all, we talk about kosher as being the adjective. Something is kosher. That steak is kosher, describing, describing it. Kashrut is the noun. So like it describes the body of laws, and I'll be using kashrut mostly to describe that. So just a, um, a definition. And I should probably say what I do in regards to this, and this is sort of this, as a disclaimer. So I, as a Messianic Jew, try and keep what I deem biblically kosher. So basically, um, as you guys would know from my previous discussions, there's a lot of rabbinic, um, there's a body of rabbinic literature, huge amounts about what kosher is and isn't. I don't look at that too much, um, you know, confession here. I just try and um, keep what I, I deem as biblically kosher from my understanding of the scriptures. And my personal belief in doing that is I believe in the, in the authority of the Torah to inform my lifestyle today. That's, so that's, that's my opinion of that. I will also say, though, even from a Torah pursuance point of view, I say Torah pursuance because um, Torah observance is technically impossible today with, without the temple and without you know, some of the conditions. So I say Torah pursuance. Um, even from a Torah pursuance point of view, um, it is actually, you know, there are arguments against keeping or against kashrut being mandatory or being like something that has to be done today. So honestly, you know, I will reiterate this. I'm actually unsure about, um, about the answer. So if you guys are asking me today, should I keep kosher? The answer is I don't know. So that's something that you have to decide for yourselves. Um, I decided this for myself based on this reasoning, but that's my reasoning. And like I said, as we'll go through, there are arguments against it too. And basically, what I'm talking about today is a broader discussion of the significance of kashrut and the lessons it'll teach us. So that's, it's a more generic, not generic, like a general discussion and a more sort of, like, not an overview, but more so like a, um, a spiritual understanding, so to speak, of what kashrut is and what it teaches us today. And we will examine potential rationales. So as you guys might know, there is no direct reason given in scripture for, the re, um, for kashrut, um, but there are some good theories out there, so we will talk about each one, not because I think they're all correct, uh, but um, they do have some lessons to teach us. So I put this in italics there, because it's important. I'm not going to be talking about how to keep kosher, that's not what, um, so if you guys voted trying to figure, you know, if in, with, um, in mind learning how to keep kosher, this is not going to be that, so I'm sorry to disappoint you, you have to leave. But <laughs> No, you don't have to leave. But it, yeah, that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. And also, I'm not going to be giving direction on whether you need to keep it or not. So that's, again, if that's what you were hoping for today, yeah, I'm sorry. Too bad. But anyway. Um, but we can learn a lot from just examining Kashrut. And I think the lessons we do learn are relevant, whatever your stance is on this issue. So I will summarize the laws because without knowing what the laws are, there's no context for what we're talking about. So I will summarize them. If you don't believe me, I base my discussion on um, Leviticus. There's a few chapters. So Leviticus 11 from this portion, which is the main body of laws, but also Leviticus 7, Leviticus 17, and Deuteronomy 12 and 14. They're the main um, sources for the biblical laws. So um, essentially, um, only, only mammals which have both a split hoof and chew the card are kosher. So, for example, so chewing the cud basically means you basically regurgitate your food and then chew it again and makes it go and then it goes back down. So it's like double digestion. And split hoof is, you know, I'm sure most of you guys would know, it's, um, you know, when the foot has it's completely split. I mean, I don't know, I'm not very technical there, but that's like, so like, like a pig's foot is, is a split hoof, a cow's foot is, a, you know, is, is split. So, for example, of kosher mammals are cows, obviously, sheep, goat, deer, buffalo. Um, if an animal only chews the cud, but doesn't have a split hoof, for example, a camel or a rabbit, um, and only has a split hoof, which is, for example, a pig, they're not kosher. It's pretty straightforward. 
Um, also, the animal has to be slaughtered specifically for the purpose of consumption. So if you find a carcass in the wilderness um, and it's like dead already or strangled or not killed, according, like not slaughtered um, properly, it's also not considered kosher as well. In terms of seafood, um, if it has fins and scales, they're kosher. Um, there's some traditions regarding this, but I won't go into that today. Um, in the Torah, examples of non-kosher birds are given, um, but what they have in common is they're all birds of prey. So it doesn't actually say, don't eat birds of prey, but it gives examples like the vulture, the eagle, etc. And they're all, they're all birds of prey if you look at it. So basically, all non-birds of prey are technically kosher. I say technically because um, Jews today would not eat birds which don't have a reliable tradition of being kosher. So let's say, for example, you, you discover some exotic bird on the island of who knows where, and it's not a bird of prey, you still wouldn't, Jews wouldn't consider it kosher because it's not traditionally kosher, if that makes sense. So it's, again, a, it's a fence law, so to speak. All crawly things and swarming things, for example, lizards, insects, spiders, etc., are not kosher, except for locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. So the French who eat snails, they're not kosher, but some people who eat um, grasshoppers, for example, they are. I'm not sure why, of course. Um, anyway. Um, and other laws, all plant-based food is kosher. So if you're a vegan, congratulations, everything you eat is kosher. Um, <laughs> Blood must be drained before it is eaten, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, why the reason that is. It's very important. Also, certain fats and nerves must also be removed. Again, there are some important spiritual implications of that. And meat and milk being separated, so that's a debatable topic, which we will talk about a little bit later. But that's, again, the general summary of what is considered kosher. So, let's talk about the broader lessons. Again, I'm not going to talk about the specifics um, beyond that. It should be enough to give us the context as to what we're talking about. But let's talk about some of the rationales and what we can learn from them. So the, one of the most popular arguments is the health arguments. So the logic goes that God cares about our health, which I think he does, of course, and he cares about what we eat, and he doesn't want us to eat unhealthy food. So that seems logical if you look at it from a superficial perspective. So blood, as we know, carries diseases. Many non-kosher animals are bottom feeders. So, of course, like insects and certain seafood, they're bottom feeders, theoretically a risk of disease. And some non-kosher animals, of course, for example, also carcasses. Like, you know, if you eat a carcass in the wild, that's also very risky in terms of a disease point of view. You, you never know what that has. And some non-kosher animals were at higher risk and are at higher risk of transmitting disease. For example, in the medieval period, pigs were, had a higher chance of transmitting trichinosis, which is a sort of parasitic infection. In the modern era, um, monkeys are likely the source of HIV. You guys would know what HIV is. Um, the terrible virus which causes, causes AIDS. Um, again, it's not, it's not confirmed for sure, but they believe in the 70s there were monkeys with a similar virus called SIV, which basically were eaten by people and then it mutated. That was, that's the main theory that has the most evidence for it. Again, we're not 100% sure, but yeah, that's an example. And also bats. A friend, it's the bats. The bats are amazing animals. They're, I respect bats a lot. They're the only mammal which can fly it's by self-powered, but Bats carry disease, for example, and people eat bats around the world, as you know. They carry Ebola, which is obviously very bad, and they also carry, apparently, COVID-19. So, um, depending on what you believe. So, but, that's, but anyway, even if they didn't carry COVID-19 and came from a lab, again, I'm not sure, but, you know, and I, I'm not, it's not, even the World Health Organization, there was someone who said that we're not sure it's from bats. So, again, I'm not just saying rubbish here, but essentially, bats carry diseases. Put it that way. Yeah. Bats carry disease. So the Rambam actually has a very good quote in his Guide for the Perplexed, and he actually summarizes this theory for us very well. And this is obviously coming from a 12th century, 11th century point of view. And he was someone who likes to find the rational reasons for everything. And in his view, it was actually, even though the Torah did not give us a reason for Kashrut, he said it was the responsibility of every person when they follow things in Scripture to find the reasons for him. So he found that as a holy task. So he tries to give his reason from his, again, understanding from you know, 800 years ago. God knows that in all foods prohibited to the chosen people, elements injurious to the body are found. Quite complicated language, but for this reason, God removed from us, um, removed us from them so that the souls can do their functions. So basically he thought that Kosher, non-kosher was unhealthy, essentially. And there is actually some scientific evidence. I want to talk about this. Um, this is actually quite um, relatively recent. So there was a gentleman called David Macht, um, who was, an, you know, he was actually in the 1950s. He was an Orthodox Jewish scientist. 
and he basically did some experiments that were published in 1953. I actually include the link at the end of the slides if you want to actually read his paper. You can actually read it um, for free. So it's because obviously 1950 is not really paint, painted anymore. So it's at the end of the slide. Um, it's called, um, do I have the name of it here? I don't have the name of it, I can't remember. But it, when, when it, it talks about the, the, the title at the end, which talks about the Bible, that's his study, essentially. So what he did was he basically um, he took extracts from non-kosher animals and kosher animals. He randomized them. And basically, he fed them to seeds. So basically, um, when you're watering plants, obviously, um, they grow. Um, what he did was to see if his experiment was true, he, he instilled the water from non-kosher extracts in one, in one group, and he instilled the water from a kosher extract in another group, and to see how it would affect the plants. And according to his research, the non-kosher non plants now um, didn't grow, and the kosher plants did. So that was his evidence to say, again, he was a scientist. Fully a scientist, in, in, in his point of view, there must be some injurious um, perspective from you know, injurious reason why the the plants didn't grow. And of course, um, you know, you guys will be familiar with the Seven Day Adventists. Um, there's been many studies done upon them because they all have greater life expectancies than the average population. They live. It's actually consistently in many studies, four to seven years longer than the average person. Um, men are seven years longer, women are four years. And basically, of course, they, um, I mean, they keep more vegetarianism, really, but um, they derive their inspiration from scripture as well. But um, some inconsistencies. So first, it's not a perfect argument because many of the health concerns are redundant. I wouldn't recommend eating bats, but um, for example, pigs, um, most pigs in modern farms today don't have trichinosis, so again, it's kind of a redundant reason today. It's also very easy to keep kosher and eat unhealthy. So if you guys have ever went to a Jewish feast where there's lots of, you know, pasta and, um, um, I don't know, like, challah's not very healthy either, really, like, you know, so like, you know, lots of very unhealthy foods, Jewish cakes, you know, kosher food can be very unhealthy. So if really... If God was wanting us to be healthy, he should have said, don't eat unhealthy food. He should, you know, why go through all the... Again, that's, that's the inconsistency that people have found, and I agree with that. And the scientific evidence that I mentioned to you could be explained by different reasons. So even with David Macht, I was reading, you know, examining his methods. Um, he didn't obviously use every non-kosher animal. He used very few non-kosher animals. And there could be other reasons why, like extra from, from those compounds cause those issues, not necessarily because they weren't kosher, it's impossible to say, because he didn't test every single non-kosher animal. And also from the Seventh-day Adventists, there was actually some further research done, and they, they reckoned the reason why they lived longer was because they didn't smoke as much, so they had less cardiovascular disease, and their, um, their vegetarianism means they had less bowel cancer, because processed meats cause bowel cancer. So they, they don't think it actually was because of their kosher diets. But anyway, it's interesting to talk about that. So that's the health argument. There's also the morality argument. So in specifically regards to kosher slaughter, basically people say it's more humane than the average way of killing people. Well, not people, not, not people, sorry. Animals. <laughs> Cut that out. I didn't mean that, no. That was a, that was a slip, slip up, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, don't, don't misquote me, please. Anyway. Gosh, that was embarrassing. Okay, yeah. Um, the, most, the, the, the more humane way of killing animals, um, if you guys know how kosher slaughter works, it's a very quick, clean cut with the sharpest possible knife through the neck. They die almost instantaneously, as opposed to stunning the, I mean, stunning the animal and shooting it in the head, which is how a lot of animals were killed um, prior to modern times, or I mean, in sort of like until um, probably the um, 50s and 60s, I'm not exactly sure, but um, it's, a very, it's a very common way of killing animals, so this is considered more humane. And in regards to meat and milk, so it's not completely, the, the rabbi's interpretation of the scripture, don't cook it in its mother's milk, is not completely false, in the sense that doing that actually has an association to idolatry, but also with animal cruelty, because basically you've got offspring of this animal, and you're killing this animal using a life-giving substance from the, same, from the mother. So when you think about the, the principle behind that, it does seem a little bit cruel to kill, you know, to kill an animal using a substance that gave it life, or is supposed to give it life. So from that principle, we'll, and also this related principle of not slaughtering an animal and its offspring on the same day, I've got the reference there, Leviticus 22, verse 28, um, people derive that it's a good moral principle to just completely separate the two. Um, and therefore, modern Orthodox Jews will separate meat and milk. Now, um, 
I can speak from experience that most Orthodox Jews do not think of these principles when they're keeping the law. They just think it's in, it's in the Talmudic references. But if you're looking at the principle, that could be the reason why. So again, make of it what you will. That's um, the best rationale I can, I can come up with for that. But if also there's also inconsistency even here, because if you're basically saying if cruelty was the main reason for the kosher laws, why not ma mandate veganism or vegetarianism? You know, if you really want to be cruel to kind to animals, it's much more kind not to kill them than to kill them humanely. Um, so, um, but and also I mentioned the Garden of Eden diets because there's, there is, a, there is a, um, an opinion out there that God originally wanted us to be vegetarians. Um, and the reason people say that is, I love meat, so I'm not saying this at all, but basically what, what people say is that in the Garden of Eden, God only gave them the fruits of the trees, so plant matter, and they were not given meat until essentially like, you know, Noah. So basically people say God intended us to, this is like the purest diet, this is the diet before the fall, only since the fall, essentially God said, oh, you can eat meat now. So again, I don't think, I mean, I like meat, so I don't want to think that. But also, I, I, I don't, I'm not personally convinced by that argument. I just thought I'd mention it just, just because it's, it's there. Um, but anyway. Now, this is getting to the um, arguments which I find more convincing. Keeping Israel distinct. So, of course, it's hard to, um, it, it's hard to dis, um, mix with people if you can't eat what they eat. If you have to, you know, if one person has to eat pork, um, pork chops and the other person has to eat lamb chops, it's a little bit hard to um, mix with people, especially in the olden days, because in the olden days we didn't have the variety of foods um, that we have today. Um, you usually had a diet which is distinct to a particular area um, because of what's available. And, people, and you couldn't transport food as easily. So this issue was much more of an issue um, prior to you know, the Industrial Revolution. And basically the, the story goes that it comes with the understanding that God wanted Israel to protect herself from the, corrupti the corrupting influence of the nations and also to keep her distinct as a people. So I've uh, listed some references there. I will read the references because they are useful to illustrate the point. Um, Deuteronomy 12, 29 to 31. When the Lord your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, talking about the Canaanites, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you not be ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? That I also may do the same. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abominable thing that the Lord hates they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. So again, God was worried that Israel would learn from the nations and do their really terrible practices. Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 2 to 3. Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. And as we know, it was a terrible thorn in Israel's side throughout the first temple period of being, um, of incorporating worship of the true God with the worship practices of the other nations. So this was definitely advice that was very useful, but not heeded. And mentioned in context, Kashrut in Jeremiah 14, which actually is the second biggest source of kashrut after Leviticus 11, is actually mentioned with some of the practices of foreign nations. For, I'll read um, the first three verses of Deuteronomy 14. You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any boldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession, as of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You shall not eat any abomination, and it continues with kosher laws. So, first of all, it mentions, it mentions the, the mourning practices of the nations. As you guys might know, um, some of the ways that the, the nations mourned their dead was to sort of, instead of just tearing their clothes, they would cut themselves, they would shave their heads. It was the way that they, they mourned. And God was saying, don't do that. That is not what you're, the nation of Israel is supposed to do. And in that context, it actually mentions um, um, the reason for that is because they were Am Segula. So Am Segula means a treasured nation, a treasured possession to God. And it, it's, it's, a, a, it's, a more, it's a stronger connotation than, than even the English word for treasure. It's even like, it's like the most precious thing to God. It's like the number one thing. So God was very concerned about the um, spiritual well-being of his nation. And in that context, it goes straight into Kashrut. So basically, it could be argued that those reasons are linked to so basically keep Israel away from the, the practice of the nations. Very interestingly, which is actually something I never noticed before, 
In the same, in the same paragraph in, in verse 21, non-Jews who were sojourning with Israel, who were living with the nation, actually were allowed to eat strangled animals. So um, it actually says that um, you may give the meat from strangled animals or from carcasses to the foreigner, but the nation of Israel may not eat of it. So, um, I'm paraphrasing here. So basically, it seems to imply, which again, something I've never noticed until now, it seems to imply that perhaps even non-Jews living with the Israelites were allowed, we didn't have to follow these laws, essentially. Um, and it comes from scripture itself. And let's, let's go over to the New Testament now and, and we'll take this further. So in Acts chapter 10, we all know that Peter was shown non-kosher meats. Um, when God told him he is allowed and supposed to associate with Cornelius with the Gentiles for the sake of the gospel. And Peter learned obviously a very valuable lesson and he says in Acts 10 verses 34 to 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, many people... Um, have used this to, disprove, to say that Peter abolished kashrut, which is obviously not the case. He was not against kashrut per se. But it is interesting that God uses the symbolism of kosher food to explain this lesson. So I don't think that's a coincidence. Perhaps because it was so ingrained into the Jewish um, disciples to avoid Gentiles, and perhaps the main medium for this separation was kashrut, perhaps. If this was the case, it could be argued that with the Brit Hadashah, tearing down the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, this principle no longer applies, or it applies in a less strict sense. Does that make sense? Am I going too fast? Like, basically, I don't think it's a coincidence that God chose to show Peter to explain this principle. I, I, I don't think it was a coincidence that he, sh he showed kosher animals, non-kosher animal, non animals. Because if that symbolism had no power, it wouldn't have meant anything to Peter. Like, why couldn't he have showed him a, a different image to explain that principle. Um, of course, it could be strictly a symbol, but also I think it reflected the, re the reality that they were living in. The reality was that the Jews and the Gentiles were separate, and it was interesting that the non-kosher animals were used as the representation of um, why that was so. So that, for example, in instead of, let's say, showing flags of the nations, I mean, they didn't have flags back then, but like, you know, for a modern example, why not show a flag, or why not show, let's say, um, you know, another symbol, why a kosher animal. So I think that's not a coincidence. So I think there is an argument to be made that a big part of kashrut was the separation of the Jews from the nations. However, even from our context in the Brit Hadashah, there is still a role we believe here, we don't believe in um, replacement theology, there is still a role for a distinct Israel. So if, that, if there is a role for a distinct Israel, and we believe the role of kashrut was for a distinct Israel, therefore it would still be applicable today. So again, it's not a perfect argument. Another example that's used is separating the holy from the profane. And very clearly from our parasha, we can actually see this in action. So I will read quickly from Leviticus 11, verses 43 to 47. This is within the context of the kosher laws. You shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarms. You shall not defile yourselves with them and become unclean through them. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the, earth, on the ground. For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law about beast and bird and every living creature that moves through the waters and every creature that swarms on the ground. To make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creature that may be eaten and the living creature that may not be eaten. So, of course, within the context of talking, especially because he was giving the laws about not eating creepy crawlies, essentially, Within that context, he's talking about holiness. I am holy, therefore you have to be holy. And it is interesting, if you even look further back within Leviticus, it is commanded that Israel has to look for holiness. They weren't allowed to ignore holiness. They had to look for it and they had to grab onto it. So Leviticus 10 verse 10. You are to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the clean and the unclean. That was a commandment given to Israel. And I think that applies to us today just as much. Even utensils which touch non-kosher animals have become unclean and had to be either cleansed or broken and discarded. It implies that there seems to be some spiritual, mystical elements to kashrut. It wasn't purely just about, you know, the diet. There was some spiritual lesson here. Because, you know, if, if you know, it's similar to spiritual impurity, if it could be transmitted, you know, that's obviously not, it's not directly a physical thing because physical things can be taken, can be removed. But spiritual things are hard to remove, of course, as we know. 
Now, most commentators do not believe that non-kosher meat was impure in itself per se. There were, most, most of them don't believe that oh, pigs are innately impure. I mean, some do, but most of them don't. Um, but what they believe is that they are symbols for Israel. They were symbols for Israel to learn from, to train them to separate the weightier matters, the weightier um, things that are holy versus the weightier things that are unholy. And also, um, they believe it teaches us discipline to sort of curtail our appetites somewhat, um, um, in the sense that, you know, Israel was not fully given over to their desires to eat. Like, and that's a similar rationale to why some people fast regularly. For example, like, you know, um, fasting is seen as a good spiritual discipline. Um, part of the reason for that is it teaches us discipline in the sense that we are not completely bound to our physical desires. We do have to exercise control over them to draw close to God. So, and, and, not to, and that's not to say that eating is bad, of course, but it's basically saying that it's useful to refrain from our full freedom to eat whatever we want and whenever we want to draw close to God. It's the same principle. And there are actually other commandments which um, draw on a similar principle. For example, there's a commandment called shatnez. Shatnez. Um, it's a really interesting word, shatnez. So shatnez is basically the commandments to separate. Uh, well, in, in a garment of clothing, you're not allowed to have wool and linen together. And it's a very odd um, confusing commandment, which I don't pretend to understand very well, but um, it seems to me that the principle of separating or teaching us to separate the holy from the mundane seems to apply for Shatnez as well. And even from the Brit Shah, I do think there is actually some evidence for this. Um, and I actually found this evidence, uh, I think there's some evidence for this um, um, in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. So in Acts 15, verse 20, it says, but you should write to them. Um, so, of course, the context is they're basically teaching that, you know, the Gentile believers who are drawing to God, so essentially don't, don't burden them with the, you know, essentially with the covenant that the Jews are under, essentially. Um, but it says you should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. So, as we can see, the last two things, being strangled and, uh, things being strangled and things uh, and blood, obviously parts of Kashrut. And they are directly associated with avoiding idolatry and avoiding sexual immorality. Um, very strong correlation here between this aspect of kashrut and between you know, sinful practices, unholy profanities. So again, it could be argued here that why would the council highlight these four things, not anything else? You know, yeah, sure, blood might not be healthy, whatever, but there must be something else to it. He's talking about spiritual things here. It's a very strong profanities. There must be a reason to it. And I do think there is, you know, I can't really pinpoint what it is exactly, but there must be some correlation between this lesson that we're supposed to learn and um, the, this aspect of kosher anyway. So that's where I, I draw the conclusion from here. However, it must be very frustrating because I'm giving one thing and I'm saying there's actually problems with what I'm saying. So it's very, it's, it's kind of annoying. But I do think what Yeshua says earlier in the Gospels actually does shed some doubt upon this explanation too. So, um, as you guys would know, in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, again, I would love to read these um, fully, but we don't have time today, but you guys will be familiar with um, the unclean hands, the unceremonially washed hands. Yeshua's disciples were criticized by the elders, by the, um, the, the Jewish leaders for eating with ceremonially, ceremonially unclean hands. Just to explain what that is, basically... Um, Orthodox Jews, what they do is, um, prior to eating bread, um, they would ceremonially wash their hands. It's not really any different from washing your hands normally, apart from the mechanics. It gets the job done. But essentially, they would do it in a ceremonially distinct way, and they would say blessing. And that way, they would ceremonially cleanse their hands to be able to eat. And that's a tradition that has basically, obviously, um, was around in Yeshua's day too. It's not part of biblical kashrut, but it was... Um, basically something that was seen as necessary to avoid um, imparting spiritual impurity into the person from what they ate, essentially. And so, many people have basically said this is, this is a reason that Yeshua, so Yeshua obviously was, was challenging this, and basically many people see this as Yeshua abolishing kashrut altogether, which I would strongly disagree with that. Um, a cursory reading of this episode might lead us to that conclusion, but if you read it in more detail, um, we'll see that he's actually not talking about kashrut per se, he was talking about something else. Yeshua did not disagree with the Pharisees, with the elders, based on their principles. The principle of separating the holy from the mundane, on maintaining, um, you know, purity is something that he actually, um, he 
he um, emphasized that. And um, he emphasizes this, um, we can see this from um, earlier in Matthew, in, in, in chapter 7, verse 6. He says, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them un underfoot and turn and attack you. So he's, he does agree with the idea that if things are holy, you protect them. You do separate the holy from the, from the mundane. However, what you sure was disagreeing with the Pharisees here was that he was disagreeing with the application of the principle. The principle itself was correct, but the application was not. So basically, what the, um, he actually explains it himself quite clearly. I'll, I'll just quote from Matthew chapter 15, and um, I'll read verses 10 and 11 and verses 15 to 20. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. I'm skipping forward here. But Peter said to him, Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil, thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So again, I mean, I, I could, you know, it would be an interesting discussion to go into Mark 7, especially, and talk about, you know, you know, the, the you know, all foods clean past. But again, I don't have time to do that today. But, um, you know, just saying, this is what his discussion was about. It was about the discussion about the unclean hands. What he is saying here is that while holiness is important, it truly comes from what comes out of a person, not what goes into a person. It doesn't come from touching an unclean animal or eating without ceremonial washing or even from creeping kosher itself. He's, these are not things, even though, like, you know, these are in Scripture, these are not things which define if a person becomes, you know, tarnished or impure. It was what comes out of the person that does that. That's what he's saying here. And, of course, you can see um, throughout the rest of the Gospels, Yeshua criticizes the hypocrisy of the Pharisees um, or the leaders because they would keep to the ritual standards of purity, but they would do terrible things to common people. So this is his principle here. So if Yeshua's words attest that holiness does not come from what goes into a person, um, what we previously said sort of loses a bit of power, if that makes sense, especially in our context. The last argument I'll go into, sorry, I'm going, I'm going quite long here. The last um, reason that I will go into is, and this is actually for me personally, what I'm actually most convinced by, um, it's all related to the temple. So basically, there is an argument, and um, I actually think one for Israel taught on this um, a few years ago, but basically there's an argument that Leviticus is all about um, the temple, and, and the Kashrut, and Kashrut is all about the temple worship. Now, the study of Leviticus 7 is useful, and um, Leviticus 7 is talking about the laws of sacrifices. I, I was going to read a, a large chunk of it, but I, I don't think we'll have time today. What I would recommend um, you guys doing to learn about this more is reading Leviticus 7, the whole thing, um, you know, when you have a chance to at home, and I will just explain the conclusions um, from this. Uh, there's a lot to read, so I won't read all of it today. Um, so basically, to summarize, it talks about the importance of holiness and ritual purity. Purity. It gives the laws of, the uh, of some of the sacrifices. It mentions specifically um, killing the offerings in the appropriate places, um, of draining the blood and throwing the blood sprinkling on the altar, and also certain parts of the fat of the animal also as part of that sacrifice on being spilled onto the altar. And it uses as examples of the sacrifices kosher, only kosher animals, for example, sheep or goat. And we, we learn about the role of blood and the holiness of blood, but also the role of blood in the sacrificial process in Leviticus 17, verse 11. The blood contains the life of the animal, and hence it's there to make atonement for us. Given in this context, we know that, of course, blood's not kosher, but the reason it's not kosher is because it, actually tell, well, it pretty much tells us, really, it's not kosher because God gave us blood for a different purpose, not to be eaten, but to give atonement for us. So, extrapolating from this, also, there are certain fats which are not kosher, and we know the reason they're not kosher is not because they're so terrible and unhealthy, it's because they were used as part of the sacrificial process. So, extrapolating from this further, if um, this part of kashrut is directly related to the temple service, perhaps the other parts of the kashrut are also indirectly related. That's the argument. And for this reason, a significant portion of kosher laws are directly linked to the sacrifice, and also... If you think about it, 
we, we, we are, in terms of animals given these examples for the sacrifices, we're never given pigs, we are never given camels, we're only given essentially kosher animals, which I don't think is a coincidence. The laws concerning sacrifices were described as perpetual in Leviticus 7 verse 36, but interestingly, the kosher laws in Leviticus 11 were not. They were not. No, there's, it, 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 it never says that they will be abolished, but it never says they were perpetual. Not in Leviticus 11, not anywhere. So, if even the perpetual sacrificial system was ceased, because of course it was uh, two reasons, because the temple was destroyed, but more importantly, because it was fulfilled through our Messiah, Yeshua. We all believe that his, his sacrifice fulfilled the sacrificial system, and in Hebrews portion today goes into that and explains why. So if it was fulfilled, if Yeshua fulfilled this perpetual obligation, perhaps Leviticus 11, which is not considered a perpetual obligation, perhaps that was fulfilled along with that. So that's the argument. And personally, that actually caused me to think about, I'm still thinking about this, that's actually causing me to really question the rationale for Kashrut, because if that's true, then it could be argued, even from a Torah pursuant perspective, that kosher does, does not apply. And again, I'm coming from a perspective of being Torah pursuant. I, I read it and try and apply it into my life. But even from that point of view, it could be argued. However, I will also say there is an inconsistency here. And the main inconsistency here is there is no direct allowance for this in Scripture. So it is a lot of guesswork, an estimation here. Um, I think it's a good estimation um, by whoever thought of this argument, but it's not, it's, it is inferred. <clears throat> so let's go into the conclusion. As you can all see, there are strengths and weaknesses to each argument, and I genuinely don't know, don't know the answer. I don't know why Kashrut was given directly. There are many good arguments, but they all have their flaws. I think whatever conclusion we do come up with, though, we can learn some broad lessons, and we can learn from these laws. I think the, the principles that we learn, they actually do apply to us, regardless of the conclusion that we come to. So there's each individual person which has to weigh us up for themselves and come to their conclusion. But there are some lessons we can learn. Firstly, God cares about who we associate with. We need to surround ourselves with people who will elevate our actions and not lead us into sin. And this is personified in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But now I am writing to you, Paul, not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater, revel reveler, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a person. So again, directly related to the idea of eating and um, association. God cares about separating holy things from the mundane and the profane. From Exodus 44, verse 23, They shall teach my people the difference between holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. God is holy and he wants us to be holy unto him. Leviticus 19, verse 2, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And also from 2 Corinthians 7, chapter, um, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. Our holiness is to bring light into the world and also to bring glory, of the one, the glory of, to the one who sent us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, talking about the believers in Yeshua, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And I think those things ultimately are what, um, again, um, um, can defile a person from, you know, coming out of a person. So I'll end it there. It was a lot of discussion without any conclusions. So I'm um, sorry if you're looking for a conclusion. I really didn't find one. So I, I couldn't, with, with good, with good, um, you know, with good intentions, give a conclusion to this discussion. But I hope what this helped you guys to do today was learn more about the topic from a spiritual, broader context and not so much worrying about whether you have to keep it or not, but more so much, you know, what can we actually learn this in the life of um, believers today and also in terms of fulfillment of, of, um, you know, of the gospel as well. So thank you guys.